Please be seated. Well, good morning, my dear brothers and sisters. Good morning, Father. So today we gather on this first Sunday of Lent to embark on a profound journey of transformation that begins by entering the desert of repentance. So today the Holy Spirit is extending a gentle invitation for you to join Jesus in fasting by abstaining from your favorite foods and your favorite drinks for how many days? 40 days. So we don't have to fast on Sundays, but the other days, 40, we do. Now, if you haven't started fasting yet, then consider starting up Monday morning, unless medical reasons prevent you. Now, this Lent, our Lord Jesus desires that your fast delves into the depths of your heart and soul. Now, to help you decide what to do for Lent, what to give up, we have a handout. Now, I encourage you to take it home. It's yellow in English, and I think it's purple in Spanish. Take it home, read it, make your resolutions. You can literally write them right here, and then put it like on your refrigerator. And next time you're going to go open the door, you'll remember what you're fasting from. Now, that said, turn with me to today's gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 1. We're going to begin in verses 12 to 13, which says, The Spirit drove Jesus out into the desert, and he remained in the desert for 40 days, tempted by Satan. Okay, so let's stop right there for a moment. So the first thing that we notice is that Jesus is driven by the Holy Spirit. It's like, Jesus, get into the golf cart. I'm driving you. Not to the beach, not to San Pedro, not to Cancun, not to some luxurious location. No, the Holy Spirit drove Jesus where? Into the desert. The desert. Why? To confront Satan on his own turf. In the Bible, the desert is a place of testing, of purification, but also of encounter with God. Likewise, in the desert of our lives, that's where we confront our temptations, our weaknesses, and our sins, and also experience a transformative encounter with God. Now, in the desert, our Lord Jesus entered into a great spiritual battle with the demons, and his weapon of choice was fasting. Fasting. There are some demons that you will never conquer unless you fast. Now, Jesus fasted not just physically, but spiritually. His fasting, again, is an invitation for us to join him in the desert this Lent. So please heed the call to enter your own desert, not to escape, but to confront the temptations that entangle you like a web. It's an invitation to fast, not merely from food, but from the distractions that keep you distant from God. So let's, let's move forward now to verses 14 to 15, which say, now after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. This is the time of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Okay, so immediately after Jesus finished his 40 days of fasting and temptations, he started getting to work to establish the kingdom of God. And what is the kingdom of God? Well, the kingdom of God is within every heart, every soul, every marriage, every family, every town, every nation where Jesus is acknowledged and obeyed as king. Simple as that. And yet Jesus insists on two necessary elements of his kingdom. Verse 15, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So Jesus is asking two things, repent and believe. That means to believe in the good news, that, that he died for the forgiveness of all of our sins and that he rose from the dead to fill us with new life, with eternal life. And Jesus is inviting us to believe in the gospel, not just intellectually, but to embody, to embody the gospel in our actions. Yet the reality is that most of us, we already believe in the gospel. So I think the problem is not that we don't believe. Perhaps the real problem is that we don't actually live 
what we believe. If we truly lived what we believed, I think our church, our community, our town, our world would be remarkably different. And yet today, I want to focus on the first essential element that Jesus taught us, the virtue of repentance. So what is repentance? Let me, let's begin by defining it. Please repeat after me the following definition. Repentance is... Repentance is when a sinner like me, when a sinner like me is, internally humbled, is internally humbled and externally reformed. And externally externally reformed. reformed. That's it. In other words, repentance consists of two parts. An internal change to be humbled, but also an external change to be reformed. Now, the word repentance is translated from the Greek word metanoia. Would you pronounce that after me? Metanoia. Metanoia. Now, meta means change, and noia means not, or noia means thinking. So, metanoia literally means to change your way of thinking. thinking. So, metanoia is an internal change of your mind, your heart, your purpose, your attitude. Now, in Hebrew, the language of Jesus, the word repentance is pronounced teshuva. Would you repeat that after me? Teshuva. Teshuva. And teshuva in Hebrew literally means physically turning around and heading the opposite direction. So teshuva is an external change of behavior. Yet it's not enough not only, only to stop sinning and feel remorse. You also have to start doing something good externally. For example, a, a person could say, Father, I don't get drunk anymore. I don't use illegal drugs. I don't steal anymore. And I respond, well, praise God, that's awesome. That's not enough. It's just mere correction. You also got to start doing something good with your life. Teshuvah is the call to stop singing, turn your life around, begin to obey the, God's commandments and do something good with your life. So true repentance requires both an internal change, metanoia, and an external change, teshuva. Now, what if you only have an external change on the outside, teshuva, but not an internal change, metanoia? Well, you become a hypocrite, just wearing like a mask. What if it's the other way around? What if you only have an internal change, metanoia, but there is no external change, no teshuva? Well, then you become a coward because you're not showing it on the outside. That's why true repentance requires both metanoia and teshuva, both an internal and an external transformation. For example, what animal do you think manifests repentance? Think about it. I propose to you that a butterfly demonstrates repentance. Let me explain. See, before a butterfly was a butterfly, it was a a caterpillar, like a worm. And it experienced this metamorphosis from a caterpillar that crawls on the ground to a beautiful butterfly that is free to fly. See, when you are deep in sin, I think you're a bit like a caterpillar, you know, like crawling on the ground. But when you experience like true repentance, you are mirroring the transformation from a caterpillar to a, a butterfly that also makes you spiritually beautiful and free so do you feel more like a caterpillar a worm or more like a butterfly another question why is jesus calling us to repentance and the reason is because the problem is not the sin jesus died to forgive every sin the problem is if you don't repent of your sin then you won't be forgiven what I fear is not so much the sin itself. What I fear is the day I don't repent of the sin. Because that day I could condemn myself. Now a virtue is the midpoint between two extremes. And repentance as a virtue stands in the middle point between two extremes. At one extreme you have presumption. Some persons do not repent because perhaps out of presumption or indifference hey i don't need to repent or others simply because they have a really hard heart and with no remorse 
I've heard of some criminals, you know, in jail that have like zero remorse. Now at the other extreme, at the other extreme is you have extreme remorse or, or despair. Some persons feel so guilty of the gravity of their sins that they lose all hope, thinking they could never be forgiven, not even by their family, not even by God. And some persons who despair will even commit suicide, and it breaks my heart, because that's exactly what the demons want, it's just to destroy us. And the virtue of repentance is that middle point between these two extremes, because yes, it recognizes the gravity of the sin, but it also holds on to hope in Jesus' forgiveness. So if your sins seem like huge or unforgivable, unforgivable, never, never despair. Instead, let your repentant heart hold on to God's mercy. Now, there are four basic steps on the path to true repentance. I'll go quickly through them. Step number one, recognize the gravity of, of our sin. A person has to first recognize the seriousness or the gravity of their sin. Here's an important truth. Eternal failure is possible in your life. Now, the ultimate failure in life would be to fail at the most important thing in life, which is not becoming a child of God and not entering heaven. In other words, heaven and hell are real possibilities for all of us, including me. So recognize the gravity of your sin. Step number two, remorse for our sins. So once you have seen the gravity of your sin, now it's time to cry your sin like that little baby. For example, your eyes are made for two purposes, to see but also to cry. Well, similarly, your spiritual soul must see your sin and then also cry your sin. This implies feeling remorse, sorrow, pain for your sin. Repentance truly regrets that our sin has offended God, our loving Father, and hurt our neighbor. Step number three, confessing our sins. So true repentance includes a confession that is voluntary, can't force it, that is specific and sincere. So for us Catholics, this implies at least an act of contrition, with the intention, if possible, to go to the sacrament of reconciliation with the priest as soon as possible. Now, the confession times here in San Pedro every Thursday from 11.45 a.m. to 1 p.m. during lunch, I have them right here. And every Saturday from 4 to 5.30 or any other time by appointment. And this Lent will also have some special times made available to you. Step number four, turn away from your sin. So true repentance requires that you turn your back to your sin and that you actually begin to follow the way of the Lord Jesus. Physically get away from the occasion of sin. You know, turn off the computer. You know, get out of that bar. Or, or ne if necessary, run. That's why repentance requires th that a sinner be internally humbled, but also externally reformed. That means run. Jesus is seeking sincere repentance from you and me. So do me a favor. Please tell the person next to you, Jesus wants you to sincerely repent. Could you say that? Jesus, Jesus wants you to sincerely repent. Perhaps saying that to that person for good. God is also saying it to you. Saying it to you. These steps on the path to repentance form like a chain reaction of blessings and transformations in your life. For example, a friend of mine named Tom Nimi from Michigan gave me permission to share his testimony. Tom committed some very bad crimes and he was sentenced to 60 years in a federal prison. Tom is sort of a scary looking dude. He's a good friend of mine, but check out his picture right over there. That's Tom, okay? Now, for the first 10 years in prison, Tom was filled with anger and arrogance and pride and hate, and he would curse persons of faith, but his mother started praying and fasting for him. And then he started having dreams about Jesus. And our Lord Jesus started talking to him in his dreams, 
And so Tom decided to attend an eight-week Bible study that were being offered in the prisons, you know, a seminar on the Holy Spirit. And Tom went on a retreat, and he repented and confessed his sins for the first time in like a super long time. And at the retreat, they laid hands on him and prayed for the Holy Spirit. And that day, Tom felt pretty good. But then in his cell that night, he started praying. And that next morning, the following morning, he started praying from his heart. And, and in his prison cell, he says he was filled with the Holy Spirit, Spirit in an incredible way. And Tom, Tom told me that he felt his hands were like on fire. And his entire body was like on fire with love for God. And he could actually feel like the nail marks of Jesus in his hands, his side, in his feet. And he felt inside of him like the heart of Jesus, like burning with love. And Tom gave his entire life to our Lord Jesus that morning in his prison cell. And he started reading the Bible and it actually like made sense. He, the word came alive for him. And he began to proclaim the word of God in the prison. And Tom started praying for prisoners and a lot of them started getting healed. And many prisoners began to convert to the faith and were baptized, including Muslims and Jews. Now, Tom's mom, he kept, she kept praying and fasting. And this time, not just for his conversion, but this time that he'd get parole. Now, she was very sad because the first time it was denied, he was denied parole. But Tom would tell his mom, Mom, don't be sad. I'm here saving souls. This is my purpose, saving souls in prison. Mom, if I had to stay in prison for 100 years, that would be okay with me because I'm fulfilling my purpose. And so Tom truly experienced both an metanoia and teshuva, both an internal and an external, and he changed and he found his purpose in life. This is what true repentance looks like. And yet God had great mercy on Tom. Because for good behavior, and I'm sure with the prayers of his mother, a judge gave him his freedom after only 16 years of a 60-year sentence. And this, is a, this huge transformation started because Tom did one thing. He repented. And then he believed. And so I invite you to make with me five decisions to grow in the virtue of repentance. If you wish, repeat after me. I will, I will recognize the gravity of my sins. Recognize the gravity of my sins. Second decision, I will, I will express remorse for my sins. Express remorse for my sins. Third decision, I will, I will confess my sins. Confess my sins. In a manner in a manner that is in a manner that is voluntary, specific and sincere. Voluntary, voluntary specific, specific, and, and sincere. sincere. Fourth decision, I will, I will run away from the occasions of sin. Run away from the occasions of sin. Final decision, I will, I will be internally humbled, be internally humbled and, externally reformed. and externally reformed. Amen. Amen. Live these decisions. And the virtue of repentance will trigger a metamorphosis in you. And your life will be transformed like a beautiful butterfly. May this Lent be a time of profound encounter, spiritual growth, and transformation in your desert. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.